when I was asked if I would like to interview Alan Beck, I was really thrilled because as you saw from the promotional publicity, he has an amazing background. Um, and you probably checked him out on LinkedIn and whatever else. And so I think we're gonna have a really interesting conversation talking about the luxury business, talking about the retail business, talk about talking about how to make decisions in in retail and in luxury and particularly in this time of COVID which is changing all of that luxury and retail so I think we're going to have a really great conversation so I'm going to start off asking Alan a few questions and unfortunately because of our technology we can't see Alan but we'll be able to hear Alan and uh, so I'll start off asking a few questions he'll answer and we'd also like to get questions from you as well. So you can use the Q&A and ask questions and I'll bring those into the conversation as well. So, so thank you very much for your engagement and your questions as, as we go along. So Alan, why don't we start off with you just telling us a little bit about your career. It's really amazing. So just give us a quick synopsis of, of your career and how you think about it. Sure. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for, the, thanks for the introduction. Hello, everybody. And I apologize for the technological uh, issues here. But anyway, yeah, I have, you know, basically, I owe my background to BU. Um, back in 1967, I took a retailing course with uh, Professor Alan E. Beckwith. And um, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, um, I, I was going to be an accounting major, which I thought was pretty boring, but that's what my father wanted me to do, so that's what I started off to do. And um, and so I, I had this great course, um, and it's kind of interesting. When I was reading um, Alan Questrom's background, when he said why he gave all of his money to BU, um, or a significant amount of money to BU, his background was very much similar to mine in that uh, neither of us knew what we wanted to do. We took Alan Beckwith's retailing course. He introduced us to uh, retailing, to creative uh, marketing. Um, there was a, uh, I remember in my marketing 301 course, there was a, a big seminar given by Federated Department Stores on creative merchandising. And I said, that's what I want to do. And so I was pretty fortunate, and I, I interviewed with a number of companies, packaged goods and non-packaged goods companies. Um, after I went, they went to Stern after BU, and I got some interesting offers in retailing, one for Bloomingdale's and one for A&S. Um, and so Bloomingdale's actually was also at that point the offer came from uh, another great creative uh, merchant prince by the name of Mickey Drexler, who was a BU graduate as well. Um, and so Mickey offered me a job at Bloomingdale's and I got a job via Questrom at Abraham Strauss and that was 25% more money, uh, which in those days was a whole $12,500 a year. Um, and I started off a career in retailing. And when I went in, um, and I chose retailing, frankly, over a job with, at that point, with Cheeseboro Ponds, which is packaged goods. And I felt that retailing gave me an opportunity to... Um, learn consumer non-packaged goods. And that's, you know, it's hard, there's a huge amount of money that's made in consumer non-packaged goods, but it's hard to get into those businesses. So retailing gave me that opportunity and I was pretty fortunate. I worked my way up. Um, my first job, I was an MBA and the first job, first day in my job at the Federated Department Stores, I was in the television department and they gave me a can of Pledge and a rag and told me to go polish the TV screens and polish the TVs. So, you know, you start off, uh, everybody starts off at the bottom, and that's where I started off at the bottom. I was the highest paid assistant buyer in Federated, and I'm polishing television sets. But it, it teaches you a little bit of humility, and it teaches you the bottom. So from there, I went up, and I had careers at, at A&S. I was there for 10 years, and I was in uh, appliances and televisions. I was a cosmetics buyer. I was a sportswear buyer working directly for Mickey Drexler at that point. I was a uh, blouse buyer. I was a cosmetics divisional merchandise manager. I was a home furnishings divisional merchandise manager. And um, 
At that point, it was uh, nine years and 51 weeks, and I was fortunate enough to join the Ralph Lauren Cosmetics Group when Ralph first launched his uh, fragrances. So uh, my career has been pretty much in the fragrance and beauty industry at that point, and I was president of, uh, I worked for Halston when that was a big business, and it was part of Playtex and Max Factor. Uh, I was uh, president of Jean Petit Paris, which was a wholly owned subsidiary of which was Joy Perfume, which we can talk about, a lot of stories about that. And then I was I ran my own business, which represented probably 10 or 15 major companies in the beauty industry in the U.S., um, and went on to, you know, develop other brands, et cetera. So I've got a lot of brand experience. And it all came, frankly, from Alan Beckwith and using a slide rule in his class before there were com calculators and before there were computers and um, and that introduction to retailing. So I certainly didn't, I was not as successful as Mr. Questrom and I've never made as much money as Mr. Questrom, but our careers really started in the same place and they started at BU. So um, it, that's, that's my life. That's really interesting. And it's so funny that you say that you had that rag and had to clean the, the TVs. My very first job after my MBA was doing store resets of bar soap at the grocery store, the bar soap section. And I had to take all the bar soaps off and clean the shelves and put them back on. It's a great way to learn, isn't it? What is it yeah, it really is. Um, is. Is I remember when I worked for Dial and then also when I worked for L'Oreal, what they who they called the nose was said to be, I don't know if this is true, but they said it was the highest paid person in the company because of the talent it takes to determine a, a fragrance and a successful fragrance. Um, that job is so, you know, the importance of, of the package and the fragrance, it's all so, um, you know, image driven, how I think about it, you know, how I think about myself when I smell that fragrance on me. How do you make decisions in the fragrance business when so much of it is about image and evoking feelings from people? Well, there's there's two parts of it. You know, there's today in today's world actually the the, the nose is becoming a, a much more prominent part of the uh, of the industry. It used to be sort of a hidden career, and now people focus on the nose and and and, and the person who actually makes the fragrance. Um, I think the it's it split two ways. The um, the first thing that's going to attract you, it, well, let me put it this way, the image and the packaging and the background, which we can talk about, is going to attract you, but it's the fragrance that's going to keep you for a repeat sale. Mm -hmm. So when I first started in this business, there were maybe 300 new, you know, not even, maybe 200 new fragrances a year. And last year, there were almost 3,000 new fragrances a year. So that's not cumulatively, that's a year. So how, does it, how do you get to, to break through that, that, that noise as, as a brand? So a large part of it is the branding, which we can come back to. And, and, but that's the, only the first purchase. The key to making money in any industry is the repurchase. How do you get people to be a loyal uh, part of it? Uh, today, customers have... Um, have uh, wardrobes of fragrances. One of the things that research showed is that, um, it's kind of interesting, women buy a fragrance based upon their emotion. Men buy a fragrance based upon their activity. So women will buy a fragrance because I'm sad today, I wanna to be, ha it's a happy, sad day, I'm in love, I'm not in love, I hate them, I love them. Um, that's how they're gonna decide their fragrance. Men are gonna decide the fragrance which is, um, all right, I'm going to the gym, I'm going to work, um, I, it's Saturday night, you know, this is, everybody, guys have a killer fragrance. You know, this is the one for Saturday night date, this is my killer fragrance. So, one, there's a difference between how men and women buy it. Um, the other part of it is the whole thing with luxury, you know, luxury marketing. And for years I was, um, for 16 years I was president of Joy Perfume. Joy Perfume is known as the costliest fragrance in the world. And it's the benchmark fragrance against which all others are measured. But um, it's kind of interesting because I always thought that in the beginning that people bought it um, because of what it represented. 
um, what it represented because it was the costliest. It, it cost the most to make. It was 12,000 flower, mini flowers in it, and etc. And I used to go on QVC television and sell this directly to consumers. And I would go and I'd try to sell it based upon uh, Jean Petou's history in fashion. I would try to sell it uh, once I, I brought 10,000 jasmine flowers onto a TV studio with 28 dozen roses. But when customers called in, they always called in and talked about memories. And um, it was their memories of what that fragrance meant to them, which kind of gave the emotional uh, relationship with a brand. And so establishing that emotional relationship with a brand is what you're really looking for. Um, so luxury marketing, so if you switch for a second from, so if you put in the back of your mind that, that emotional reaction relationship with a brand is still important today, more important today, because that gives you reorders, that gives you loyal customers. Um, there's an old saying in, in, in anything in sales that it costs a lot less to keep your customer than it is to get a new customer. So that brings us to how do you market a fragrance in the luxury market? So. Uh, Pat, I think you want to kind of talk about that a little bit. So um, luxury marketing is all about aspirational marketing. It's all about um, you are defined by what you have. You are defined by what, what you do. Um, in L.A., you are what you drive. In New York, you are what you do. In Paris, you are what you wear. And that helps to define you to people who don't know you. Um, so... It, it you know what you really want to do in luxury marketing is you want to um, establish your brand or product as a benchmark which which people you want to be the benchmark you someone who has your product it shows who they are what they've accomplished what what they mean in life um, some people can say well that's kind of phony and it doesn't appeal to everybody, but there's a large part of the world that an aspirational market means something. Someone who wears a Louis Vuitton bag, it says something about who they are. Someone who drives a Jaguar, it says something about who they are that is recognized by other people. And the key to, to that is one is tap into aspirational, and two is viral marketing. So viral marketing existed be long before Mal Malcolm Gladwell made it an important thing and made it newsworthy. Um, because any good merchant, any good marketer knows that viral marketing is the way that you become aspirational. Um, and one of the things that I, I like to talk about, I, I had signed licenses for fragrances for two different designers. One was um, um, Christian Suriano and the other one is Tadashi Shoji. Now, that might not mean anything to this audience, but Christian Siriano won Project Runway. He was a darling of designer. Um, and on the other hand, um, Tadashi had a $50 million business in clothing. One of them, for Siriano, it was very hard to sell to buyers because he didn't have a big business, but it was easy to sell to consumers because he was aspirational. Tadashi, on the other hand, was an easy sell to the retailer because they had a huge business in him, but a tough sell to consumers because he's not aspirational. Why was he not aspirational? Because women had his clothes. So every, he, he made great $500 cocktail dresses. Everybody had those dresses. It was no longer aspirational. Whereas Christian Suriano, for a a $5,000 wedding gown or a $10,000 wedding gown or a $5,000 cocktail dress, that's aspirational. And that's what people wanted to wear because it made a statement about who he was. So luxury marketing, aspirational, are you defined by what you have or by what you wear. Um, getting there is viral. Um, and you need to establish yourself as the benchmark fragrance. Rolex is the benchmark watch. Everything else is measured against Rolex. And it got there by sticking to who they are. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's where I am. That's great. So there's an interesting question from an incoming student. So welcome to Questrom, um, who asks the question, um, this person comes from a technology background and 
particularly now when they say, you know, we've advanced five years and five months, or maybe five weeks it's been, um, in the situation that we're in where technology is affecting everything, right? And, and technology is a part of everybody's life in every industry and in every sector. Is there a scope to use technology in luxury marketing? Um, or how do you think that with this high aspiration that you're talking about, uh, technology can help embellish that? Does it get in the way of it? How do you, how do you think about that? Uh, that's a really good question. And you and I had talked about that when I brought up the whole thing about g gut instincts versus data. So I think my first thing is that data is a lot about the past, which gives you some in Whoa. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, there you are. You were muted for a second, but you're back. Alan? Uh, Pat, can you hear me on the computer? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? So I think disconnected from the phone, which is why uh, he's not able to hear us. Okay, hold on one second. I will call him. All right, he's calling right back in. And if you have other questions, feel free to put them in our Q&A. I have loads of questions. I could talk to them all day long, but I want to also make sure that we answer your questions. Okay, I think I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, so I was talking about the fact that data is a lot about the past and gives you some insight into the future. And sort of the gut or instincts is more about the future, but you have to use data to refine it. So, um, you know, years ago, data was very limited and you bought things or you developed things um, by, by gut instinct. And if it sold, it, it, it gave you some data. investment. It's a great tool to minimize your inventory, but it doesn't tell you about new things. It doesn't help you discover things. Um, and so, it, you know, you have to put it in perspective. I don't think you can run a business without it. Um, today, there aren't a lot of great merchants around, but merchants are what develop new things. The Elon Musks of the world had great ideas. Um, Bill Gates had a great idea. Data helped him get there. But it didn't really start him. And so I think you have to put eye on data. You know, every time you hear an ad on TV for financial services, there's always this uh, sort of comment at the end that past performance is no, is no guarantee of future performance. And, um, and I think that's very true in I think that's an important way to look at it. And I think particularly with the high image um, products of, of, of luxury, that there's so much that's really um, emotionally based that's hard to be predictive. But we have another question here, which I think is, is, um, is interesting um, in this time of COVID. Um, and this is from an alum. Thank you for, I'm glad you're here. Um, what are your thoughts on how luxury will change post COVID-19? Um, I have mixed emotions on it. Um, there's an article that um, as soon as China opened up retail, there was an, an Hermes boutique. It was in, in Shenzhou that did 2.5 million USD the first So, you know, the, the first thing that people ran out and bought in China in, in, in large quantities, I'm not talking about all, all people, but they did two and a half million dollars in one location in one day on Hermes goods. Um, I think that 
Um, I think that in, in what's happening in the economy today is, is, is kind of split in a way. Obviously, it gives everybody a sense of, um, you know, looking at their life and saying, you know, where am I and what are my values? And that happened in 2008 as well and where, you know, where are my values? But I think there's a huge difference in, in, in the way the population has been affected. For those of us who are fortunate enough to have jobs that we can do remotely from home, and um, other than watching our 401k fall apart a little bit, but having a long-term perspective, our life might be a little bit more miserable and we have um, cabin fever, but we're not, on a, we're not in a food bank. We're not on a line to get food. Um, so, um, and I think that probably um, those who are big luxury shoppers are hurt less than those who are not. I think it will rebound. Um, but I think people will be more cautious and, um, they, you know, they're going to look at whether they're going to spend $3,000 for a handbag or they're going to spend, uh, you know, $20,000 for a watch and they're going to think twice of, about it. Um, but innovation always brings new, new business and brands don't go away and, and tough times brands are, are, uh, last longer than those that, that, that don't have a foundation. So, um, you know, it's going to take time. Listen, I've lived through 2008. I've lived through a lot of recessions. Um, business comes back, uh, comes back in different ways. Uh, but I don't think it's gone, and I think that the true brands, luxury brands, will remain strong. And they can withstand without panicking um, um, you know, a shortfall in business. Yeah, that's the value of brands, right, is that people trust them. And so they may go down, but they come back because you know that those are the ones that you can trust. And actually, you know, really interesting thinking about um, luxury as well, because those are the brands that are aspiring that people trust and, um, and, and will come back. We have, um, we have lots of questions for you, Alan. This is great. Um, Okay. So, kind of going back to your your aspirational um, uh, comment that you had, um, one of the questions is, "What is your take on whoops, move around um, on brands that have a value proposition?" that emphasizes craftsmanship, which is what a lot of luxury is, right? It's all about the craftsmanship and how it's made and where it's made and what the, the materials are. But they're, it's understated. So you don't know that I'm driving a Jaguar. You don't know that I have a Louis Vuitton bag. It's understated and it's quality above everything else. What is the role for those brands in, in, in the luxury marketing? The more that understated as opposed to let me tell you who I am. I think the understated ones are really the most valuable ones because the customer that recognizes that what it is without it without an LV on it is the is the real luxury customer and um and I actually it's a really good question because I really believe very strongly in if you tell someone why it's worth what it's worth mm -hmm. it goes a long way and I talked about Joy Perfume, and Joy Perfume has 10,400 jasmine flowers and 28 dozen Bulgarian roses in every ounce, which is, explains why it's so expensive if you try to do that in the, in the way it's handmade. And I used to go and tell that story all the time. Um, I once took 28 dozen roses on the floor of Neiman Marcus Houston in order to show a customer, this is the, obviously to attract attention, but to show a customer that this is what it's worth. Um, but different people value things differently, and, 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 and I remember a story about, um, you know, a, a Marriott told a story where, you know, they had just upgraded um, a lot of the hotels and put lots of pillows on the beds and did duvet covers and all these things, and it was a negative customer comment from a customer said, you know what, I'm, in this case, he was an engineer, so it's the truth. So I'm an engineer. And I just want a bed to sleep in, and I don't care about all these all these pillows, and I don't care about all these covers on the bed, and I don't want to pay forty dollars extra for it. But you know what? That's fine. And so you can stop. There's a hotel for you. So there's a Ritz Carlton, and there's a Days Inn, and everybody has to value it differently. So, but the whole thing is, how do you tell that story? Um, you know, uh, my girlfriend does not have a lot of labels in her wardrobe. 
versus my ex-wife and um and her so for her birthday i bought her a vuitton wallet but i bought her one without the lvs i bought her one that someone who knows vuitton who knows quality would know it's that kind of a bag it's understated so understated elegance is is a large part of the value of of, of luxury marketing and Hermes is the best of it. Rolex is the best of it. Chanel is the best of it. It's all about can't have it. The um, best sales pitch I ever heard was a, it was a salesperson in Denver, Colorado, selling one of my perfumes. And a customer came to her. It's a true story. A customer came to her and asked her, what are you wearing? And the sales girl said back to her, you're not ready for it. I'm sorry, based upon what you're wearing, you, you're you not ready for this exclude, you know, the, the fragrance comes, Osmantis comes from the Himalayas on the back of a yak that comes down from the mountains once a year to the market. And the more she told the customer she couldn't buy it, the more the customer wanted it. So, and it, its value is in what you can't have, the value that it's unique, the value that you can tell someone you have something that no one else has and that you're a really good consumer and that you're a, a pr smart person, that's what it's all about. I remember one time I went into uh, Neiman Marcus to buy a handbag. And so I was talking to the woman and about what I wanted and she goes, oh, you're an entry level handbag customer. I was like, <laughs> right. no way, I am not an entry level one. It just made me want to go higher. So I totally right exactly what you're saying. So we have some um, questions about um, luxury, and then we're going to go into re talking about retail and bringing those two together a little bit. Um, but we have a question about there are many many luxury brands in the world, and if you were not with a big company but with a small um, company wanting to launch a luxury brand how can you compete with those that already are so established and already have a great reputation what advice would you give them well i think it's it that also is a good question but i i, I think it's it, it's it's kind of, it's, it's really kind of relevant and um so first thing I, I always when people come to me with luxury brands that they want to bring into the market um and you know, years ago, may, start this way, Macy's today is 45 separate retailers that are all under one name today. So there used to be 45 separate buyers and every city that you went to would have two retailers or three retailers. And if you didn't, if you couldn't sell it to one, you'd sell it to the other. Uh, today, you don't have a lot of choices. So um, it, it, at the high end, you have Neiman's and Sachs. In moderate, you have Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom's. And then, uh, I'm sorry, high, uh, more prestige and moderate, you have Macy's and Dillard's. And there's a couple of other smaller players. So a large part of what you bring is based, the question is what retail prices? Because if you're high-end retail, you, that sort of sets where you're going to go. So I, one of the things I always tell people is that it, uh, when a Macy, if you go to a Macy, a Macy's customer if the Macy's customer never heard of it, it's a liability. If the Neiman Marcus customer never heard of it, it's an asset. So that's a very important to you because if they sell it and a customer sees it at Neiman's, they're going to say, wow, I need to have that because Neiman's found something that somebody else doesn't have. If you try to bring that to a Macy's, the Macy's customers will say, I never heard of it. So I'm not interested in it because I don't trust it. I need to have a brand name that I, that I know. So branding is more important as you go, I'll use the word down market, and exclusivity is more important as you are up market. But if you can have a luxury, if you can have a, a fragrance and you're going to sell it at $500 and you're going to go to Macy's to launch it, it's not going to work. 
And if you have a fragrance that's $95 and you're going to go to Neiman Marcus to launch it, that's not going to work either. So you have to match it to your customer. Right, right. So we have some questions about um, what's going on with retail right now and luxury. Um, and as we know, unfortunately, some of the brands that you just mentioned, uh, Macy's, Neiman's, JCPenney's, you didn't mention, it, are they're hurting right now. Um, and with a lot of retail uh, consumers likely going to be slowly wanting to go back into physical stores, right? And we've realized how easy everything is to do online. How do you think that will affect the luxury business in particular? Um, because, the, you know, the, the online versus offline, the touching and being sold versus, you know, the efficiency of online. How, how do you think that that will affect that change in retail? How do you that will affect luxury so there's a there's a lot of points in that in that pot uh, to be made um, you know part of it is um, generational uh, younger people millennials um, or people listening to this other than you and I Pat are are going to be more comfortable buying online uh, than are um, people who are a little bit older. Um, people a little bit older tend to have a little bit more money, and so they're they're more comfortable buying in person. Um, buying the the luxury experience of going in and into a luxury store, speaking to having no trouble finding a salesperson, having a long conversation about all the other things that you own, and having them engage with you buying that product, having it wrapped in a fabulous bag or in a box with tissue paper and a ribbon and a, and a, and a shopping bag that you walk out of the store with an aspirational name on it, um, that's not going to be replaced soon um, for many audiences. Um, put that aside, jump to another conversation. Many of the luxury brands in the world are owned by European companies. The French are very slow in adopting to internet buying. Um, very, Europe is very much behind the U.S. So um, luxury buying as a percentage of it, online, as a percentage of total, is not what it is in other places because the leading luxury manufacturers, by cultural difference, are reluctant to go in that and to sell a $4,000 handbag online. So part of that is, is from the manufacturer, part of that is, is the luxury market. Um, the other thing that, that in reality is that um, so many online purchases are reorders, the common things, the things you're comfortable in buying. They're not new things. Um, but one of the things that has helped that, and Nordstrom's has really was the first one to really kind of start it, is buy it online and pick it up in the store. And the retailers are totally overwhelmed by the acceptance and the popularity of that part of the business. Um, what they found is people, yes, they want to buy it, but they'd rather get it in the store and they'd rather look at it before they walk out of the store because returning it is a pain in the butt. Um, and then they can change the size if they want it. They can return it without leaving the store and buy something else. So that has become a much larger part of the buy online business than people ever imagined. Um, and, and like the, you know, Nordstrom says, it kills their main floor metrics because devoting a large part of their core to service rather than selling, but it brings people into the store. Um, so that's another element of it. But another part of it is, as I saw one of the people asked about, um, that came up a question about online purchasing and luxury. Mm -hmm. And um, it's tough. I've tried to launch fragrances online. Fragrances is very difficult. Skin care is very difficult. Um, you know, what does it smell like? Um, how do you get through? So then, you know, Amazon has programs for sending sampling out, and you send out 10,000 samples. And, and, and what's the, you know, because in reality, it's smelling it and feeling it and touching it that's going to get someone to buy something new. 
So, you know, I, the last seven years I worked for people who were the same age as my children. And they kept sa saying, retailing is dead, retailing is dead, retailing is dead. Retailing isn't dead, but the nature of retailing is changing. Why is Neiman's in trouble? Neiman's is trouble not because they're not doing business. Neiman's is in trouble because of financial engineering and a high leverage from, from, from uh, private equity, which bought them out. That's why Neiman's is in trouble. They're in trouble to pay their debt, not because the business is inviolable. Um, the same thing with uh, Sears. Sears went away because of financial engineering, not because Sears was a bad merchant, though in, in certain aspects they were, but they had great brands they developed, diehard batteries, craftsman tools, all those things that, 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 that they, Kenmore appliances, but it was financial engineering. Yes, America is overstored. Does Macy's need 800, depart 1,000 department stores? No. There are lots of uh, malls that have two Macy's in them. Why? Because one was bought from someone else. One was at Marshall Fields and one was at Macy's, and now there's all, Marshall Fields is part of Macy's. So you don't need 2,000 department stores. You need 800, 700, 600, who knows? Um, and then retailing has to be redefined as entertainment. Uh, Bloomingdale's does that better than anybody else. So retailing has to be entertainment, putting restaurants into retailing, making it a destination again. Um, maybe you're going to buy your socks. When you need new socks, maybe you're going to buy that online. Absolutely. But it doesn't take away from the experience of buying something new in fashion. Yeah, I, I so, bought an um, uh, uh, eyeliner pencil from Chanel Online because I normally go in their stores. I can't go to their stores. The package that was delivered to me, it was a $28 purchase. I shared it with my branding class because they still did everything to make it so beautiful when I opened it. I took pictures of it and I posted it on Questrom Tools so that my branding class could see it. But because, you know, you're right. They really want to be able to control that image, even though online it was just a functional click. The delivery of it still was what you wanted from Chanel and, and people still still want that. We have a question. Yeah, um, it's the same. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the same thing like in, in liquor. I, I I mentioned to you my daughter is in the spirits business and she went from being in brands to working for a dot com, a startup dot com that connects branded liquor with retailer because liquor laws are restricted to difference by state. So a liquor car, you, Moe Chandon can't sell you directly Chand uh, Moe Champagne. It has to be sold by a liquor store. But Moe wants to control that experience. They want the website to be their website, not Allen's Liquor Store's website. Right. And then when they and, and when that bottle of, of Moet Chandon or Cristal gets delivered, they don't want it delivered in a brown paper bag with a with a cardboard divider. They want it delivered the way that Cristal should be delivered. So part of what what she is doing is getting a network of retailers. So when you and so that website technology puts together the branded uh, liquor distributor. And Allen's liquor store, making sh and and so they do the technology to handle the transaction, but they they make sure that Allen's liquor store delivers that bottle of Cristal in a better way than a bottle of Smirnoff vodka. Right, right. And so, right, exactly what you want. That's beautiful. Um, a couple other questions. Um, what percentage of luxury retail is dependent on international travel? And given that, the, the question is, what impact if the travel industry crashes? I hope it won't crash because I love to travel. But, you know, with the effect of, of people not traveling right now, what's going to be the effect on luxury retail that's dependent on that travel? In the short term, disastrous. Hmm. Absolutely disastrous in the short term. It, it, you know, uh, travel retail is a whole business in and of itself. And anyone who flies internationally, um, what you have to go through to between security and your gate 
in terms of all those stores. You can't get there without going through all those duty-free stores, and it's a source of revenue for the airports as well as for the people that sell it. Um, it it's going to be it's it's going to be a disaster um, because. The, the only thing that might be a positive is that airports and airlines now are asking for you to check in longer, um, not because TSA lines are longer, but because they want to um, have people, you know, six feet apart in the line to get on the plane. They don't want the the the, uh, the bridge to be full of people, so you're going to be in the airport longer, and maybe you'll you'll be there and, and buy things. But um, in the short term, I think that it's going to be hurt more than anything else, because a large part of the duty-free retail is based upon local taxes, because luxury is taxed differently around the world. The U.S. really taxes luxury less than anybody else. Um, so, um, you know, if you're, if, so it, it has to do with international travel, and, and it has to do with, with um, different markets have different strengths. It's kind of interesting, so that, um, Outbound, out, what you see outbound in an airport is based upon destination. For example, um, when I sold Joy Perfume, Joy Perfume is a French brand, but its biggest customers are in the U.S. and Japan. I also sold Lacoste Fragrance, and Lacoste Fragrance is a huge European brand, and those days wasn't big in the U.S. So what would happen is that when I sold Joy at the airports, it had to be outbound flights to Japan. Mm. I couldn't sell it outbound flights to France. Mm. However, Joy was sold at Paris Airport outbound flights to Japan and to the U.S. Mm. On the other hand, Lacoste, I couldn't sell domestically, but I could sell it outbound flights to Japan. I could sell it in French Canada, but not in British Canada. So, um, but, but the bottom line to it, look, Luxury is going to be hurt more with international travel. The liquor and the cigarette business, which is the biggest part of that, will not be will be hurt only as a function of traffic. Um, and as traffic rebounds, you'll get some of it. But um, basically, you know, we we look at we look at fragrance and cosmetics in the airport, but the biggest part of that business is liquor and and tobacco. Yeah, yeah. There's um. I think about uh, in this COVID-19 situation that we're in, how supply chains are really being affected all around the world. And, you know, I can think about it from my past lives in the shoe business. Um, and given that so much of luxury is produced in France and Italy, do you think that that supply chain is going to be interrupted? And do you think that will have an effect on either the availability of products or the quality of products as we go forward? It's a really good question. I haven't, I, no, it's funny, I haven't given it a lot of thought. Um, but yeah, it, well, yes and no, because, you know, it, the higher the luxury is, the more it's going to be, uh, you know, individual production and um, done in, in, a, in, a, in an atelier someplace. Um, and the, the good manufacturers have supplies because it's hard to get high quality. They have supplies of high quality because when they see it, they're going to buy it and they can afford to store it, leather, etc. The same thing with workers. Um, the, the, you know, the ateliers and the fine seamstresses or whatever, or um, people keep them on because you can't replace someone who's got 30 years of experience sewing fine leather goods. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's a problem. I mean, it's, um, it, it's a problem if you're buying perfume bottles from China and um, or perfume bottles and big manufacturing parts of it, yeah, that's going to be an issue till they start up. Um, I don't. Th I think it's less of a problem for craftsmen, artisan brands, uh, and a bigger. The bigger the business, the bigger the problem. Um, you know, not toilet paper, but uh, you know, still a problem. Yeah, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, and then I'll ask a, a last summary question, but. Um, one of the, the questions from one of our attendees says that, back to your, your question or answer earlier about data is primarily limited to the past. How do you conduct research um, on consumer behavior and economic and how do you, how do, you do research in luxury to, if you want to determine 
something that's going to be successful going forward? Uh, I, well, I think that looks because luxury works on a smaller scale, then you can run small, you can run smaller tests so that if you made 150 wallets in purple and 150 wallets and with green trim and the purple sold out in, in three days and the green didn't, um, you can get that point of sale data fairly quickly. And that tells you that, well, you know, people like purple or they, or neither of them sell, then you're going to find out that, uh, well, you know, putting trim on it didn't work very well. And, and, and so you can get a, a, a test on a, on a smaller scale. Um, the, you know, the research, some of the research is, is done the same way it's always been. You have focus groups and you have mall intercepts. Um, you know, you and I talked about, um, you know, I've done focus groups for fragrances and three hours later, um, I wasn't sure what they really said because mm -hmm. people tend to tell you what they, um, what they want to tell, you know, what they think you want to hear. Um, maybe, but you can get in, uh, you tend to get insights about things you never thought of out of a focus group rather than a pure answer. Um, I, I like mall intercepts. I like people to walk up and, and, and can I spray this fragrance? Do you like it? Don't you like it? Will you wear it? Wouldn't you wear it? Would your boyfriend like it? Wouldn't your boyfriend like it? And do that over, over 1,500 people in Columbus, Ohio and, and San Diego and other markets. And, and that's hard research where you can find some trends about, about things. So, um, it, it, you know, I think the larger um, instinct is important in, um, in fashion. Instinct is important in luxury. And you can do a small scale to see if it tests and then go, it gives you a trend. Um, but data, hard data is more important if you're going to invest a tremendous amount of money if you're P&G, um, instinct is not as important as data, but lots of mistakes are made. Lots and lots of mistakes are made by large companies who relied on data, but didn't really understand consumer behavior. Right, right. right. Having both of those is absolutely critical to success, I think. We have an alumni in living and working in Italy, so thank you for beaming in, um, who's works in the cosmetic industry. And so the question is, what is your opinion on the makeup market, especially the mass market, um, which has, ha has had a great slump worldwide, which has been happening, I guess, for a while. And so what's the effect of COVID-19 on the makeup market if people aren't wearing makeup? Um, and, and, and what do you think the what do you think the outcome will be, or what do you think make what's is going to happen in trends with makeup in that regard? Um, makeup has been the most resilient of every of every part of the of the cosmetics business through all upturn all the downturns that we've had. It's the um, basically the most cost efficient way for for a woman to feel better. Um, a new mascara, uh, new blush. Um, you know, you don't have to buy Chanel makeup. You can buy Maybelline um, and and get this and get the same the same feeling about it. So I think that the um, it's not going to be hurt as much. It's going to be hurt by traffic in department stores. Um, but um, you know, I know that people are today. People are buying. Um, I know from firsthand experience, they're buying Olay skincare because the Chanel, or Chanel skincare went away, but you can't really get to a store to buy Chanel, and it's sort of harder to find online. So, but CVS and Walgreens are open, and you can buy Olay at Walgreens. So it might not be the same, but it works. So I don't, I don't think the makeup business is going to be, is going to be the more re resilient. Um, I think that the uh, makeup business has benefited the most, frankly, over the years from from uh, TV purchasing and the TVCs of the world. And the most entrepreneurial successes in, in the beauty business have been with makeup because um, women have, there's been great makeup artists who have found great styles, great things that work for them, and they go on TV and they sell it whether it's a Charlotte Tilbury or an It Cosmetics or, uh, God, there's a long, lo long list of them. The same thing in skincare with dermatologist brands and Dr. Brandt and DDF. They've all been from people in the industry 
who were allowed, they couldn't have sold in a department store, but they were able to get started through TV merchandising, through QVC and home shopping, um, the shopping channel in, in different parts of the world. We haven't touched on that, but that's allowed a lot of entrepreneurial businesses to get started through a different channel of distribution that they couldn't have done in the traditional way. Um, so maybe not so much for luxury, but it's helped makeup, it's helped skin care, hasn't helped fragrance. Um, but in beauty, that part of it, because they're looking for new things, they're looking for a story, they're looking for someone to get on and tell why it worked and making that emotional connection and talking to customers. Um, and so um, I, I think that that's a big business. And that we haven't talked about that channel of distribution, but for those who want to do a startup, and have something and have a story that you can tell, go to QVC. They're always willing to listen. Yeah. So one last question, um, because I know we've we've passed our time, but we started late, so I thought it was fine to do, and we have people still hanging in. Um, I know we have, at least from the questions, we have a lot of alums. Um, I also assume we have a lot of students uh, um, on this uh, call. The question, the last question I want to ask you is, what is your one piece of advice? And this could be for alums or for students. What, what is that one piece of career advice that you would give our, our audience? What do you think is really critical for people's success? Or what's been critical to your success that you would want to share with them? Well, there's, 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 two, there's two comments. One is, um, we chatted about it. I remember when I graduated, and I think um, the dean at that point was called CBA, which was SMG, which is now a question, but Dean Phillipson said, when you leave BU, we've, we've thrown a lot of things at you over the last four years, and most of them are going to be either forgotten or certainly outmoded as you go through your career. But if we've taught you nothing else but the skills of analysis, communication, and decision making, then we've done our job. And I think that that's really a key thing. And, and the takeaway that I think everybody has to learn is, yes, you're going to learn specifics. And many things we've talked about today are, are au courant and they're, they're current. But you know what? It's the ability to communicate. It's the ability to analyze and the ability to make a decision. It's to understand a Bayesian decision tree. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I learned that at school and that's, you know, taken me a long, it's taken me a long way to understand how decisions are made, how to communicate your ideas, how to get your thoughts across mm -hmm. succinctly, how to look someone in the eye when you're, when you're, when you're doing something. Um, and how to make you know how to make a decision, how to analyze things, and that's more important than anything that 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 you've learned um, in school specifically. And the other thing is networking and the value of networking. And um, you know, I, I I look at LinkedIn, and LinkedIn everybody thinks is a great way to to get a job and to contact. But the reality of it is, is my 50-year Rolodex is worth a lot more than LinkedIn. And the same thing when you're talking to people and you're selling something, whether you're selling yourself or a technology or an idea, it's all about getting some common ground with the person you're talking to. What's going to give you that sense of credibility, that, 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 that gets cred, that street cred, that, that credibility that they're going to trust what you're going to say, mm -hmm. that, that you knew their boss's 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 boss, that they know that if they're going to take a gamble, if they're going to say, you know, boss, Alan Beck or is the guy that's there. And, and, oh, yeah, I know Alan. He's a good guy. He's trustworthy. You can deal with him. His company is relevant. His company, whatever, whatever it is, that's going to close whatever it is. And it's not just, it's not just bullshit to sell somebody something. In the end, you're always selling yourself. Whether, you know, it, it's your, your product comes with you, your career comes with you. And so it's the value of that network and the, the, the value of how you can communicate your ideas. Though, all those things are what's going to make you a success. Um, it, you know, some of it is your, 
risk taking. I always look about risk reward analysis and everything that you that we do. Um, you know, yes, you can afford to invest the money. Can you afford to lose it? Is a different question. So, yes, financial decisions are risk reward, but you know, you're always going to you're always selling something, and um, and that credibility and who you are and what your reputation is is really what's going to carry it. And that's the lesson, analysis, communication, decision-making, and networking. Yeah, yeah, uh, really good advice, really good advice. You know, I talk to so many um, students in particular, but people beyond students, who say, I hate networking. And what I say to them is, you're just having a conversation to find something in common, right? And so once you find something in common, then that relationship blossoms. And it's all right. about your reputation and about your knowledge and your ability to communicate. So I really like that. Thank you very much for that. So Alan, thank you very much. I'm sorry not to see your My face pleasure. on the screen, but I love hearing your stories and your advice is great and your knowledge is tremendous. So thank you very much for, for spending this, this hour with us. And thank you all of you in the audience for, for being with us as, as, as well. I think this has been a really great conversation. Your questions were great. It's like, come on, go having you scroll up and down. It's like, okay, how do I ask all of these questions? So right. thank you all very much for, for participating. And be safe, be healthy, and eventually it will be spring here in Boston. So we look forward to yes, that. Thank you all. Thank you everybody for the opportunity. And Patricia, I'm happy to answer those questions you know, offline at, for anybody at any time. So uh, look forward to working again and uh, thank you for the opportunity and go Terriers. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.